Welcome to the Project Endure podcast, the place where we talk about life, endurance, persistence, perspective, and so much more. I'm Joe Rinaldi, and I'll be your host. Let's jump in. Welcome back to the Project Endure podcast, episode 22. We have myself, Joe Rinaldi, and we have a very, very special guest down in Richmond, Virginia, Blake Taylor. Blake, how are you, man? Hey, I'm great, man. Excited to be here. Extremely like humble that you would even consider having a conversation with me on this, but hey, I'm glad to be here and share some insight. It's a no-brainer on my end. Uh, just for the listeners, we connected via Instagram when you originally joined the Hard Things Club through Project mm-hmm. Endure. Um, we went back and forth a little bit. We actually hopped on a phone call. I heard a little bit about your story. You asked me a few questions mm-hmm. about mine. And from that conversation, I knew immediately that at some point we had to get you on the podcast. Um, before I throw the ball in your court to give yourself a little introduction, I just have to compliment you because the people listening to this cannot see either one of us. Your beard is so, it's oh. so full, man. <laughs> I am extremely jealous and I just needed to throw that out there. You, you know, I, uh, I, I, I can't say that I do anything special with it. it. Unfortunately, like my wife continues to go on about, hey, we need to like get you some beard oil sales or something like that, right? I, I can like, I'm just grateful for the genes that my father passed yeah. down to me. You know, the, the Taylor gene is one of just like a plentiful beard and straight hair. Uh, if you could see my my twin brother, he like we're, we're opposite, but he's redheaded and his his beard at times gets down to like full ZZ top length, and it's just wow. I don't know how he does it. But. Yeah, I'm just, speaking of hard things. Growing a beard is very hard for me. Um, I mean, you anyway. I could go on and on, but let's <laughs> let's let's actually get to to the good stuff. So, Blake, if you had to give the audience a little bit of an idea about who you are and what you're about, um, how would you describe yourself? How would you introduce yourself? Oh man, uh, that's a, that's a it's a good question. I you know I don't I don't I don't think like I think if I had to introduce myself, I'm I'm just your average like average person, man. I don't really like to to say anything special. I, I say like what I do like to do is is try and connect with like minded people, try to share some motivations, and and try to you know lift up some people where I can. Um, you know I I think when it comes to to hard things like you know like we're we're going to be discussing here like everybody's been through some struggle and everybody, you know, wants to, wants to find someone who's been through a similar situation. So, you know, if, if me sharing my experiences means that like it helps somebody else out, like I'm, I'm always happy to do that. Um, I'm a people person, man. So I love connecting anytime anybody wants to reach out for a conversation, happy to do so. Um, I have a, a wonderful wife who, who is like the greatest, one of the greatest gifts that I could ask for. You know, I consider two greatest gifts in my life, one being my, my wife, the other being my son. I've got a son who's seven years old and, and love to, to see the world through his eyes. And uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's about me, man. <laughs> awesome. Simple, straightforward, right to the point. I love it. Now, Blake, when we originally connected, we did talk mm-hmm. about some of the harder things in your life. Um, and we'll just start with this first question and then go from there. But the question's a simple one. You've heard it before. Mm-hmm. Uh, what is the hardest thing or circumstance that you've ever had to handle as a person? Yeah, you know, I, I think for, for me, the hardest thing I've ever had to do is, is virtually starting over at, you know, 27. Um, you know, it was a time in my life where unfortunately I'd, I'd gone through a divorce. Uh, you know, I had a son, so I, I needed to learn how to be a single dad. The, the whole experience left me in bankruptcy and and that was a you know pretty traumatizing for for a 27 year old having to file for that and, and basically learn learn how to navigate life in, in kind of those waters uh you know ultimately led me to moving back in with my parents and you know that's really cool to stay at 27 right you live with your parents like that's cool right? <laughs> uh, unfortunately like for me ultimately like what it drug me down to feel was that by definition, like I, I felt like a failure uh, from a societal view of like what a man should be, mm-hmm. you know, and it was a very, uh, it was a very trying time to, to try and, you know, rediscover myself and, and learn how to navigate those waters. Like I said, it's just, it, yeah, that was, that's probably the hardest thing I've ever had to, had to go through. 
Yeah. So let's, let's dig in a little bit more there. And before we dig in just on a more lighthearted note, my uncle who I love, he's one of the funniest people I know. I don't know if he's listening to this, but hopefully he is. Um, <laughs> I always hear this story about, I believe he was in his late twenties and he was still living with his parents, my grandparents. Mm -hmm. And for one of his late twenties birthdays, they got him a suitcase. And uh, he was like, Oh, he was like, Oh, where, where, where am I going on a trip? Like he was all excited. And my grandpa said, open it up. And it was, it was all of his stuff. And he said, get out. (laughs) Um, But that's wonderful. That's wonderful. Anyway, I mean, Hey, if, if I was not married to my wife, I probably, if I didn't find her, I probably would be living at home with my parents as a 27 year old right now. So there's no shame in that, but why don't you take us back to the beginning of that chapter of life? Um, and what kicked all of that off for you? Yeah, yeah. Uh, you, you know, it was, um, I'd say ultimately it was, um, it, it was a space of, you know, it's really like learning who I was as an individual, um, learning, you know, learning what, uh, what experiences I wanted to go through in life, learning like, really just learning about myself to be honest with you um you know what what kind of led to those instances were just you know people not being honest with themselves i would say um and like the the experience of luckily uh my my parents uh weren't as uh forward as putting a suitcase in front of me they're very welcoming and and letting me come back to live with them um but I, i think that like for me uh, it, it was it was very it was it was very much a time of struggle to identify who I was and and really like yeah man I know, that's a good question that's that's a really good question of like what what kicked it off for me I'm 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 drawing a little bit of a blank to to be honest to to talk through it but um, yeah. Yeah, that's all good. Well, why don't we do this? Like, so bankruptcy, for example, as a topic, I think finance is something that's really, it, it, it could be anxiety producing for a lot of people listening to this podcast, people in general, myself included. And I think that's something that um, a lot of people hope they never have to think of bankruptcy. So maybe we just hone in on that for now. And like, what did that look like? What did that feel like? And where do you go from there from that point yeah you know it was it kind of what what happened there was you know going going through divorce like having to pay lawyer fees having to you know try and sell a house that needed some some upgrades to it. like it just started to snowball and snowball and you know having other financial responsibilities at the time that unfortunately uh, I just I, I couldn't I couldn't meet you know and so one thing after another like I ended up getting to a point in life where I was just living off credit cards uh, because any extra cash I had was, you know, going to to make sure that I, I was proactive with, you know, child support payments or proactive with making sure my son had what he needed. And um, so unfortunately, it, it, it snowballed and, you know, amassed almost like $100,000 worth of credit card debt. You know, it was just a very drowning feeling. Luckily for me, it was, I was able to maintain the payments, but I knew like there was going to come a time where that, you know, I was going to, I was not going to be able to make that. And so it was, it was more of a, a proactive stance on my part to make mm-hmm. sure like, Hey, like obviously down the road, I want good credit and I want good credit history. Like what steps do I need to take to make sure that future I'm setting myself up for success, setting my, my, my son up for success and being able to provide for him. Um, but, but, you know, it was a, it, it was it, in the moment, it very much feels like it's not a good experience to go through you know, looking back on it, like, I would say to anybody who's in kind of that, that situation, like there are steps you can take, you know, I filed chapter 13 bankruptcy. And so it was, it's, it's more of a consolidation of debt and getting you on a payment plan that you can afford. Mm. And really like, how are you setting yourself up for success? So like looking back on it, it's probably one of the best thing, best decisions I made at the time Mm. to make sure that I, you know, I was able to, to save face for any future, like future financial decisions that I needed to make. Yeah, absolutely. So kind of an example of making a hard, um, maybe unappealing decision at the time Mm -hmm. that you knew long term would set you up in the best position possible. And uh, I would imagine at being a father, you have a whole nother sense of what it means to be responsible um, and what it means to be 
to be a great person because not only now are your decisions affecting you, but they're molding and shaping this person that you've created that you care mm-hmm. so much about. Um, tell us a little bit about what it felt like to be a father going through all of this and even maybe what it means to be a father now. Oh, man. Uh, going through it, like we, when you're in the thick of everything. Um, so what, what was interesting is my, um, my son was very, very young at the time. Uh, he was, he was less than a year old when all of this was happening. And so, um, luckily like he he didn't have to be exposed to, to any of that, you know, and I was, I was so happy about that. The, the thing about being a father though, in that instance is like, I didn't have, I didn't have money to buy my son a Christmas gift. You know what I mean? Like that was a terrible feeling as a father. Like I move in with my parents, like they had to help me out. And I'm, I'm extremely, extremely grateful that they were, you know, they were willing to do that, willing to provide, you know, for their son and provide for their grandchild. Um, and, you know, that's, but as a father, like you feel like you're failing, you know, like I, I can't even take care of, of this human being that I promised, you know, to, to be responsible for. Um, and so that was a very hard time um, to be able to just, just like view myself as, I, I, I couldn't confidently say that, you know, I'm, I'm an example for my son. Like, I felt like I was a failure to my son. Um, now, like, hindsight's always twenty twenty, right? And in the moment, like, I was doing the best that I could to make sure that my son had a good life, you know? And if that meant living with, living with my parents, like, that's what needed to be done to make sure that I was, I was able to, to be there for him and, and do what was right by him. The, the other thing I'll say is like, I, it, while I, I felt like from the society level of view, you know, I was failing as a man. One, one mantra that I always kept forefront was like, what, what do I want to be able to tell my son when, when he's like, when he's older, you know, hopefully, like, hopefully, you know, pray, pray God, like he doesn't have to go through this type of situation, but if he ever were to have to go through it, like, could I look back and confidently say that I carried myself in the mm-hmm. manner that I, I, a man should carry himself, right. For, for my perspective. And I, you know, that was, that was something I always kept at the forefront. Um, and so like, I, I felt like I did, you know, I felt like I made the right decisions, uh, you know, and, and that's, that's kind of where it was at the time. What does it mean to be a father to me? Like, you know what, what can I tell people like it's just showing up every day you know we, we thought you know, in our community like we talk so much about consistency and, and doing hard things and just showing up every day and becoming one percent better every day you know I, I one of the fears that I had uh back when to kind of backtrack just a little bit but you know I, I don't I don't get I clearly don't get to see my son as much as I would like to but that doesn't mean that I can't create a wonderful experience and a wonderful relationship with him, right? Just take full advantage of every moment that I have with him. Make sure he knows that he's prioritized in my life and special to me. And so I made sure to do that over a long time. You know, they say, I think I'm, I'm, no, I'm no child expert, but I think that like it, between three and five are like the most instrumental years in building a bond with your child, you know, up to, up to three or up to five, it's something like that. And so, hey, like, during those years, like let's maximize every single second we get together and make sure that we have a wonderful relationship. And so like today I get parents telling me, Hey, I see the way you are with your son. I see the bond you guys have. And you, you, you know, I was with, I was with my dad full time and your relationship with your son is better than what I had with my dad full time, you know? And so it's just making sure that you over time you're, you're committing to them and, and really showing them that they are, you know, they're, they're valuable in your life and that you want to be the best that you can for them. So. Yeah. So many beautiful things in there. And I have a few, few thoughts actually, before I get to those thoughts, you actually had to reschedule the podcast. We were supposed to record this a little bit earlier, uh, you know, in the month, last month, and it was because you were spending time with your son. And I bring that up only because I think oftentimes people get, they commit to something And they think that just because they committed to something, they have to do it at the expense of things that might actually be more important. And for you, I was so happy when you rescheduled, (laughs) not because I didn't want to talk to you, but because I was like, that is incredible. You should spend the time with your son. Like we could do this anytime, but that time with your son is special. So I just want to throw that out there. Um, I was having a conversation with a connection that I made uh, earlier this week about 
children in a youth mentorship program. Mm -hmm. And this guy's incredible. He'll, he'll be a podcast guest down the road. Uh, but he was talking about how when the kids come into the program, they obviously are bringing different levels of energy. Some, yeah. some kids are a 10 out of 10. They're bouncing off the walls. Other kids <laughs> might have had a tough day at home or a tough day at school, and they're a 2 out of 10. And what he asked the kids when they come in is, what's your energy level? And one kid might say eight out of 10 and the other kid might say two out of 10. And he'll say to the first kid, okay, give me every single ounce of that eight today. And he'll say to the other kid, that's give wonderful. Me every single bit of that too. Yeah. And I, I think that is a little bit of what I'm hearing is like, you didn't have the 10 out of 10 that maybe you wish you had. You didn't, you couldn't give your son all the Christmas presents you wanted. You couldn't spend every single minute of every single day that you wanted to spend with him. But what you did have, you gave him everything. And I think that's such an important lesson for everybody listening, because we don't always get to choose our circumstances, but we always get to choose our attitude and how we show up in those circumstances, which brings me to a Viktor Frankl quote, which I absolutely love. And he hey, said, man, Joe, Joe's always got to bring the quotes. <laughs> oh man, I've got an endless stream of quotes here. I'm actually going to read two. You know what? Just to prove that point, I'm going to give you two. There you so, go. So Viktor Frankl said, everything can be taken from a man, but one thing the last of the human freedoms to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances to choose one's own way. And the second quote also by Viktor Frankl reads, when we are no longer able to change a situation, we are challenged to change ourselves. And I hear that in your story. And I'm curious if either of those quotes resonated with you in any particular way as a father. Oh, oh man. Uh, I think both do, to be honest with you, like first one is, is per, like all about perspective. Mm -hmm. Right. And as long as you are able to like keep a mentality and it, it, it then don't get me wrong. Like we all have faith we all have days where it's like, I don't, I don't know, man. I just don't know. Right. But you know, as long as you can keep a mentality of like, what's the best that can happen. Yeah. Right. Just, it, it's, it's just a mind, a mindset shift. Right. And so, you know, keep the perspective, like in the moment it might feel rough. But, you, you know, you're doing the best that you can, you know, and with the circumstances that you've been dealt. Um, and, and then, yeah, oh, man, I, I've, I, I, I got so excited. I forgot the second quote. Yeah, the second one. <laughs> I'll read it again because it's, yeah. it's, it's that good. Yeah. So it reads, when we are no longer able to change a situation, we are challenged to change ourselves. Oh, there you and, go. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it's, a, it's a growth mindset, right? Like, we always have opportunities to learn new things. We always have opportunities to, to, you know, move in different directions. Like life, life isn't a, a, you know, straight, narrow path. Like you, you can deviate and still, you know, make, uh, make good decisions and, and, and like life can turn out wonderfully and beautifully. And, you know, don't be afraid of, you know, what might come next. And, uh, you know, I don't, I don't want to skip ahead or anything, but, you know, a little like, uh, a, a little foreshadowing of what might uh, what might be to come you know like my wife is a prime example of that you know I, I never thought I'd be able to you know I never thought I'd be able to find love like I found and I'm just extremely extremely grateful for that so yeah yeah it's all about the growth, the growth mindset and where where can we take our life absolutely and before we jump to that second question and for you to expand on that point um, I, I want to throw in kind of another concept that I heard recently through Tony Robbins. Um, mm -hmm. I, I honestly, at this point, I talk so much between this podcast, the other podcast, client calls, my wife, yeah. she's probably rolling her eyes listening to this. Um, <laughs> but Tony Robbins talks about how in nature, there really are no straight lines. And when we look in nature, you look at a tree, for example, it doesn't go grow just straight up towards the sun. There are mm -hmm. branches that shoot off to the side, they twist and turn. Um, you look at anything in nature, right? Rivers wind and cut through rock. And when we look at our lives, I think a lot of times we think that things should go in a straight line, that we shouldn't feel resistance, that we should always feel good. But in reality, that's just not how life works. And there's another yep. quote, Walt Whitman, absolutely love it. Keep your face always toward the sun and the shadows will fall behind you. And if you think about that tree analogy, as the tree shoots up through the dirt, it's trying to find the sun and it might have to bend a little bit one way and twist a little bit another way, but it always moves toward the sun. 
And whatever that is in our lives, no matter what twists and turns and, and things get thrown our way, as long as we continue to find the sun, the shadows will fall behind us and we can continue to grow forward. And uh, I just, I think it's such a beautiful image. Um, yeah. I mean, they call it a rear view mirror for a reason, right? Like it's in the past. <laughs> okay. So, all right. So speaking of the past, right? So we, we've heard a little bit about that tough season in life. I'm going to mm -hmm. ask you the second question and then you can expand on what comes next for you. So yeah. what is the hardest thing that you've ever done on purpose and why did you do that thing? Yeah, <clears throat> that's a great question too, man. I, I love, I love these. I love just hearing all the different perspectives from this. So uh, I, I think the, the hardest thing I've ever done on purpose and why I did it, right? I think it's kind of on the, on, on the, the, like the tail end of coming out of that season of life. That was what I, what I consider the hardest season of life. Um, and the reason I did it is, is what we've been discussing. Like I realized I needed to grow and I realized I needed a new perspective on life. And I realized, you know, there, there's, okay, I, I thought path was going to go, you know, A, but now B seems like it's the appropriate path and I need to pivot on that, right? And, and just like be the tree to, to get, have new branches to reach the sun, if you will, you know, to use your quotes. So it was really that, and it was being brutally honest with myself about what I wanted out of life. I think oftentimes, you know, we, we get into a situation and we feel just like we've been discussing, we feel it needs to go the way that, society is telling us it needs to go you know I, I mentioned having you're know, struggling you know mentally very much with that the fact that I thought that I was failing at, at being a man of what society's view of a man was you know and, and and that's not necessarily it you know if we're looking at what what makes a successful man well I was doing everything I could for my son you know a after I made sure to get to a, a comfortable space you know it's okay what do I need to do for myself now and how do I need to make sure that my life is going forward in, in uh, you know, a way that would make me happy. And so there was also a practice of, okay, well, I really need to take stock and recognize, you know, what's in my control versus what's out of my control. And let's just focus really on that, that factor of like what I can control and what steps can I take um, to, to make sure that my life is moving to a better place. Uh, you know, one of those things was, um, I, I, one of the things that I, I thought like I wanted out of life was, you know, I wanted a, a partner to go through life with. And so also, I think, you know, one of the, the things that came from that was putting myself back out there and really learning, you know, trusting, trusting the love again. And that was an exercise of, you know, coming off the backs of finding out who I was and really aligning, aligning myself and finding a person who would align, you know, to, to kind of what I wanted out of life too. So. Yeah, I can imagine that would be really difficult after going through the process of loving and trusting and having it not work out um, and almost maybe feeling in a way that you weren't enough for that to work out. And I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I'm curious, like the contrast between what you left that first relationship feeling like and what you recognized as what you needed and what you wanted in life. Like how, how did that contrast play into it? Yeah. You know, I, I, uh, ultimately I think it was, it was just growth and, and recognizing, uh, you know, what I, what I wanted out of, what I wanted out of life, what I wanted out of a partner. Um, and, and just being honest, you know, when I, when I met my, my wife, uh, my now wife, you know, on our first, um, on our first date, we were both extremely honest with each other about what our love languages were and what mm. our, like where we wanted life to go. And, you know, we just put it all on the table and it was just so refreshing to have that conversation. But th these are expectations out of life and these are expectations out of each other. You know, there's just no holds bar. Like, let's just put it all out there and have a, a, a beautiful conversation about, you know, what would our life be? And, and then it seems like, you know, that seems like a rather intense conversation to have for a first date, right? Somebody might get scared off and like, well, wait a minute. I just, I just wanted to get to know you. I don't <laughs> like, I don't, you know, I don't know that I need to know your whole life story or what I'd be getting into. But, you know, I, I felt like that I was at a point in life also where, Hey, it's not just my consideration, mm -hmm. you know, anymore. You know, I, I had a, I have a son and it's his consideration as well. Like, you know, do I potentially see, you know, being with, uh, you know, bringing someone into my life, do I potentially see them being able to, to, you know, 
uh, be part of my son's life as well. And that, that was something that, uh, you know, we were, we were very forward with, and I just felt a, a great sense of, you know, uh, uh, partnership and, and a great sense of, of love and, and just admiration for each other, even after our first date. It's funny. Um, I, uh, when it comes to relationships, I, my sister is very much my person to go to. Like, if you don't have my sister's respect, you, it's not going to work. Right. <laughs> and so I, I went and talked to my sister after my first date with, with my wife. And I'm like, man, we did this and this and had this conversation. And she was just like, you're going to marry this girl. Like, mm. this is who you're supposed to marry. Mm. And I was like, I, I don't know. No, it's just like, no, you're going to marry her. I promise you. And so immediately, you know, having the respect of my sister, like spoke volumes to me. So. Yeah, that's cool. And, and, you know, when, when I heard you talk about that first date, I just thought about the fact that trust is really just shared vulnerability over time. Mm -hmm. And the more vulnerable you can be with another human being and the more that's shared and the longer that kind of communication exists, that's, that's how you build trust. And I am not one for small talk. It's actually a pet peeve of mine. Um, even, even to this day, and this sounds terrible, but I'm going to say it anyway. Um, when I get texts that are like, they ignite a conversation, but it's all based on small talk. And mm -hmm. clear, clearly there's a reason that somebody's reaching out, but we'll go back and forth with 10 or 15 texts of small talk before yeah. they get to it. I would much rather have someone just text me, <laughs> skip, even just skip the hello and just say what you want to say. Yeah. Um, cause, cause I think, you know, sometimes I feel like I don't have time to waste. And mm -hmm. I, I think, I think we should all live life like that. Like we don't, we don't have time to waste. And yeah. um, if, if you can't be deep and open, authentic and vulnerable with another human being, um, you're missing out on one of the best mm -hmm. parts about being human is just the ability to connect on a deep and vulnerable level. And so I think that's incredible. Um, the other thing I kind of heard in there is that with your son in the picture, you have this sense that life is just a lot bigger than you, right? It's not just about you. Um, and I think that's a really beautiful thing. And one of the things that I've talked with clients about that sometimes people get tripped up on is, okay, life is so much bigger than me. It's not just mm -hmm. about me, but that doesn't make you insignificant. And I right. think there's this really hard balance sometimes between, okay, I really don't matter that much, but at the same time, I matter a whole lot. And I'm curious if you could speak to that as a father, um, because I'm sure in your son's eyes, you're one of the most important people, if not the most important person in his life. But at the same time, um, someday, you know, you won't be here. I won't be here. Your mm -hmm. son won't be here. We all move on. So tell me a little bit about how that plays into your, your mindset these days. Like life is bigger than you, but you're still extremely important here. Oh, oh man. I, I, I love this topic. I really do. Like, it, this is just, it, it's one of those things that like, I'm, I feel like I feel chill, chills coming over me right now because I just love this topic. So they, 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 like, I'm going to butcher this number and I know I'm going to butcher it, but I know it's a, a very, like very high number, right? There's a one in like 43 trillion chance that mm -hmm. you are who you are, right? You, you know, the, the chance that you are born on, on the day you are at the time you are to the parents, like to the life that you're born into it's just like one in 43 trillion. Like it's this astronomical number that you are who you are. And I've seen Gary Vee say it before. And I, I know I'm not, not going to remember the number, but like the, the whole, you know, the whole notion of li like life is bigger than just you, but the fact that you like, there's that small percentage that you are who you are means that you were put here for a purpose and there's an impact that you can make on, on like on society as a whole, you know, and to some people, it's okay that you only make an impact, you know, to five people in your life, your core foundation of people that you, that you choose to surround yourself with, you know, some people want to go a little larger, some want to go, want to go larger than that. And that's cool. But the fact that you are uniquely you, like there's so much that you can bring to society and there's so much that you can offer, you know, everyone's got a special talent inside of them. And I think that with the rise of, you know, TikTok and, and, you know, uh, and shorts and things like that. Like, I think there is like just this wonderful plat, like these wonderful platforms for you to share your, your unique abilities for, for people. And I, I think often what happens in that is 
you know, people see the, the major influencers, so, you know, 23 million, 32 million followers. And it's like, you don't, you don't necessarily need that many people to be validated, right? Maybe you have a hundred followers, you know, a hundred loyal followers that you are making an impact. I, uh, I used to, um, for a while, something that was you know, very cathartic for me and like, um, I used to I used to write a, a a a dad's lifestyle blog for a little while, and like I, at first I did it just because I love writing and I just wanted to get some things out. But eventually, uh, I think after eight months, I had one person reach out. In the entire eight months of me doing, it, I had one person reach out and was just like, "I love I love what you're doing here. I love that you're sharing these insights, and I I love that." you know, what, what you're doing for your son. And just that one person after eight months of, you know, and you've done it, putting content out, right? You know, you finally get that one person and you're just like, well, this is cool. <laughs> like I'm making an impact, right? It just made you feel special. And when it comes to, when it comes to being, being a parent, you know, when it comes to being a father, going back to that, you know, one in 43 trillion chance, like I was put here to be that, that kid's father, you know? You are uniquely you to be that kid's father, because there was an even smaller percentage that you, that kid, you know, ended up with you. And so like, I just, it, to me, it is a, it is a sense of, you know, I am going to be my like, vulnerable, honest self to my child. I'm going to do my best that I can to, to raise him, uh, you, you know, as, as a man. And, and, you know, again, when it comes to my, my wife, like, you know, having the opportunity for like for somebody to accept me in my true dorkiness of who I am. I got, we went to, you know, we went to universal not too far back and uh, went to Harry Potter world. And I was just the biggest, biggest kid in the world. Like, Oh, I'm in Harry Potter world. And so I ordered some Harry Potter stuff off of Amazon, you know, cause I didn't quite see what I wanted there, but I got it. I got it today. And I ran upstairs as soon as it came out, like, look what I got. And she's just sitting there laughing. Like, that's wonderful. And just being the biggest cheerleader over something small, you know? Um, so like making those impacts on each other's lives, is, it's just a, a wonderful thing to, to have as well. And so I say to anybody like who thinks that, you know, there's this larger, like if they're not fulfilling, you know, the 23 million, the, the 32 million, you know, people following, like you don't, you don't need that. Like be uniquely you and whoever, whoever finds, you know, similarities or whoever finds, you know, uh, comfort in, in what you're sharing and who you are, like the community will come just, yeah. just, just be you. <laughs> I could not have said that any better myself. And you actually sparked a whole lot of thoughts on my end of the microphone. So let me spit some off. I did a quick Google search. I don't have an assistant yet on the podcast. Otherwise I would have pulled a Joe Rogan <laughs> and asked my assistant to look this up. Um, but uh, one in 400 trillion, so that is the, those are the odds that you were born exactly how you were as exactly how you are. There you go. So that, that's amazing. One in 400 trillion. Uh, and I think to your point, Blake, it's easy to feel like we're not doing enough and that mm -hmm. if we're not impacting hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of people, that it's just not worth it. But Paul Shane Spears said it really well. He said, as one person, I cannot change the world, but I can change the world of one person. And that gets me every single time. I shared that with my graduating class uh, from physical therapy school. And just the idea that every time we interact with another human being, no matter how big, how small, in public and private, it is an opportunity to change the world for that mm -hmm. person. And I think sometimes we overestimate what it takes. We think it has to be a big, grand gesture. We have to really go out of our way or do something special. But at the end of the day, something as simple as really caring about another person, listening to them, being kind to them, the small things, sometimes those small things make the biggest difference. And to boot, we might not know it ever made a difference for that person, but it might have the ability to turn their life in a completely different direction. And that is completely worth it to me. And it's almost like the ripple effect. When you drop one drop of water in a larger body of water, mm -hmm. those ripples send out in all directions. And the hard part is we never know how those ripples play out. Our actions, our words, they have second, third, fourth order effects that we never get to see, but we have to trust that those are happening. And that by being the best versions of ourselves, that we can in turn make the world just a little bit of a better place. 
Um, and I love the commercials where it's like, one guy holds the door for somebody and somebody across the street saw that happen. So they pick up a piece of trash and somebody else saw that happen. So they help an old lady <laughs> cross the street. And um, you know, those commercials always get me, but it's so true. And I think to tie this all together, putting yourself out there, whether it's on social media, whether it's in an intimate relationship like a marriage or anywhere in between, I think one of our biggest fears as humans is to put ourselves fully out there and then be rejected or not loved. And our biggest desire is to be fully known as who we are and still loved. And that's really scary. Um, mm -hmm. Tim Keller said it best. This was a quote that came up during pre-marriage counseling for my wife and I. And he said, to be loved but not known is comforting but superficial. To be known and not loved is our greatest fear. But to be fully known and truly loved, well, is a lot like being loved by God. It's what we need more than anything. It liberates us from pretense, humbles us out of our self-righteousness, and fortifies us for any difficulty life can throw at us. And that concept of being truly authentic and fully loved is just one of the most beautiful things I could think of. And it sounds like you found that, which is amazing. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely, man. I have definitely found that in spades. Like, I, I, I am humbled daily uh, at like the fact that somebody has, has chosen me as their person, the fact that my wife is just like it, easily the best person I know and how, how much like joy and happiness, not like has she not only brought to my life, but to my son's life as well. Like she's an amazing bonus mom to him and I could not have asked for more, um, which was, was really interesting for me because I was very protective over him meeting anybody when I decided it was time to start dating again I just I, I didn't want him to meet just anybody you know I wanted him to meet somebody that dad loved and I felt that could love him back and you know the fact that she was willing to accept him with open arms like yeah. oh man it was just it was so beautiful to see yeah that is beautiful and I'm glad that's the case and so why don't we shift gears a little bit and we're going to move from talking about hard things to the concept of endurance. And so the question's a simple one, and it is this. What does the word endurance mean to you? Yeah, I, I think for me, when I think about endurance, it's, it's the ability to just persevere and push past anything that you, you previously thought impossible. Uh, you know, I, I think um, that we need to recognize, you know, that life is, it's a marathon, right? It's not a sprint. And so when we think about something being challenging, you know, oftentimes what we're doing is, is making it up in our heads to be like this monumental thing. You know, we're thinking about the North star and it's like, oh, I could never get there. But what happens when you break that North star into increment, like incremental things that you need to do? Right. And over time, you build those up and you are consistent in the way that you are chasing the North Star. And, and like that's endurance. And that's really where like, you can find, you know, yourself propelling your life in the direction that you wanted it to go. Mm. Little by little, little becomes a lot. And it's hard because when you're doing just a little, sometimes it doesn't feel like it's making much of a difference at all. But when you stack that mm -hmm. up over a long period of time, you realize just how powerful it is. And I think most people don't realize how powerful it is because most people never get far enough along. They never stick with the process long enough to understand just how mm -hmm. much consistency compounds. And it sounds almost too simple and too easy to be true, but it's, it's not, it's, it's, it's not easy to do, but it's a simple concept and you just yeah. have to show up every single day, give your best, continue down the path that you feel called to be on. And if you do that for a long enough period of time, just like you said, things are going to happen. People are going to form around you in a community because I think the best leaders in the world are the ones who forge their own path, lift others up and bring others along to where they want to be. And if you can find those people who are already on the path you want to be on, it gets a whole lot easier to be consistent, to show up with them as you all strive to move in a similar direction. And that's one of the things that's just beautiful to me about the Hard Things Club and why I'm so grateful for people like you who are a part of it, because obviously we're all so different. 
But at the end of the day, we all share this desire to do hard things in the pursuit of being the best versions of ourselves. And uh, at the end of the day, we can go a lot further together. And that's why I love the concept of endurance uh, and doing that concept with people like yourself, Blake. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I couldn't have said that better myself, man. And I, I, I second your, your, your viewpoint of, you know, just appreciating the communities that, that we surround ourselves with or that ultimately we find, you know, like the Hard Things Club, man. It, it, it's, it's been wonderful to be part of the community and wonderful to see people grow and the challenges they've taken on. Um, and I, I think, you know, like, we, like we're talking about here, little by little, like that endurance is being built, you know, on individual levels. And it's amazing to see where people are going. Yeah, absolutely. So as we start to wind things down, I want to preface this last question. I've been asking this a little bit differently each time, Mm -hmm. Um, but you're a father. And as someone who aspires to be a father someday, uh, I would imagine that your son is going to go through some really tough times in life because, hey, we all do. Um, And one of the things I look back on is some of the really valuable advice and guidance and support that my parents gave me through some of the harder seasons of my life. And sometimes I welcomed it. Most times I did not. Um, And I look look back now and mom, dad, if you're listening to this, I'm sorry I didn't listen the first time. Um, But uh, I want you to think of this in terms of, right, your son someday is going through something hard. Mm -hmm. And there's also somebody listening to this podcast who's um, in the valley. They're at a low point. They're going through Mm -hmm. something really, really challenging, and they're not sure what to do next. So whether you're talking to this person on the other end of the podcast and or your son someday, what would you say to the person who's really struggling right now, really facing adversity and hardship? What advice would you have for them? Yeah. Oh, man. That's a that's a really good question. I, I, I think that when we get into, you know, valleys of despair, when we get into seasons of life where, you know, it's just difficult and we're not sure where the light of the end of the tunnel is, right? I think that what helps is to, like, as much as you can, you know, as much as you know that you want to stay secluded and you just want, you want to, you know, be alone and because it feels like nobody else has ever gone through what you're going through people have gone through what you're going through and it can be difficult, you know, to recognize that. I think it is important to know that find somebody you can talk to, find somebody you can trust and confide in. You know, for me, when I was going through, you know, all of my things, I, while I didn't want to admit it to people at the time, I actively sought therapists, you know, people who were, you know, third parties with no perspective on anything I was going through in life, but would just sit and listen to me. Right. And, um, I was, I was grateful for, for surrounding myself uh, with a friend group that wouldn't allow me to sit around and and be upset, you know, as much as I, no, I just, I'm going to stay, you know, I'm going to stay by myself, you know, I'm going to be alone in my thoughts, you know, and while that's good, there's a time and place that you absolutely need to be alone in your thoughts in the early stages, you need to, you need to talk about what's going through your head and you need to talk about it often. It's very interesting. We had a conversation, uh, you know, I think this is, this is a, 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 a great topic. Like we had a conversation uh, with my son the other day because he had a bad day at school. Mm. But when, when we picked him up, uh, you know, Hey, I had a great day at school. And then we hear from his mom, no, you, you had a bad day at school. And it's like, Hey, Hey man, like, why did you have a bad day at school? You know, oftentimes society tells us, you know, mm-hmm. you know, don't, don't talk about your feelings because nobody cares about your feelings. You know, don't keep it bottled inside. And this is exactly what I told them. Like, don't keep that bottled inside. Talk about it. You know, it's okay to be vulnerable. It's okay to release your emotions. If you're mad, say you're mad. If you're sad, say you're sad. Like, it's okay. If you need to cry, like, we'll just sit here and cry, dude. Like, here's the shoulder. Let's sit down. You get it out. And then when you're done, uh, uh, here's my ear. You just talk and say what you need to talk. And so I, I, I think it's important to recognize when you're going through those low points in life, find somebody you can talk to and find somebody there, there is going to be somebody that will just sit down with you and say, Hey, you know what? If you need to say the same thing, 10 times over, say the same thing, 10 times over, just get it out though. And then when you're past, you know, you feel a little more comfortable and 
in the situation you're in. You feel like you have a little more control over, you know, recognizing what's truly out of your control and what's in your control. Then that's when you sit down with yourself alone in your thoughts and, and grab a journal, you know, here, here's how I can make a path to getting through this difficult time, or maybe here's some resources I can look into to get through this difficult time. But really like, that, that, that's, that's my advice, man. Like, you got to talk about it. You got to communicate because oftentimes as society has told us, especially, you know, uh, it, 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 uh, especially like in hard times, society has told us, you know, in social media has told us life is always good. Life isn't always good. Like you got to find somebody you can communicate with. Oh man. Mic drop. That's it. That's it. <laughs> I, I do have two quick thoughts. And, yeah. uh, and so you know, I think on the topic of doing hard things, when we're going through hard things, mm -hmm. another hard thing on top of that is, is embracing other people, leaning into mm -hmm. other people, asking for help. And it might be the last thing we want to do, even though we know deep down inside, it's the best thing for us. Mm -hmm. And so I would say, to echo your point, Blake, if you're going through a hard time right now, as much as you might want to retreat, to stay alone, to shrink down inside yourself, do the hard thing and do the opposite. Go talk to somebody, reach out for help. And it's that concept of, you know, if your teeth are bothering you, you go see the dentist. Uh, if your arm <laughs> is bothering you, you come see the physical therapist. Yeah. Um, but when we're dealing with things that feel like they're inside our mind that nobody else would understand or could relate to. There's this stigma that gets attached to that. And I think the world is moving in a direction, a positive direction in regard to that. Um, but I just want to echo, right? If you need help, go get it. That is not a sign of weakness. It is actually the opposite. Is it, a, it is a sign of absolute strength because the act of getting help means that you care enough about getting better, that you overcame that internal resistance that told you not to do it. And, uh, and I would just leave people with that. Um, and so Blake, I know you're a man who cares deeply about other people. Um, I as well uh, am that way. And so I think anybody listening to this podcast, uh, if you want to reach out to somebody, I could speak for myself. And I think I speak for Blake, like reach out to one or both of us. We would love yeah. to be there for you. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And with that being said, Blake, I mean, if people resonated with your story, if they want to reach out, if they want to connect, where should they go to, to find you and, and learn more about you? Yeah. So Instagram, it's a great place. I'm, I'm active on there uh, at B McNeil Taylor, uh, M-C-N-E-I-L, uh, taking the Irish heritage from my, my lineage there. Um, I'm on Instagram. I'm on, I'm on TikTok. I don't have any videos up yet. I have the same handle. Um, I, I say that with a caveat that I do, like my wife has a TikTok um, that we have some shared videos on, which is cool. Um, yeah. Yeah. Mainly those two places. If you want to find me, uh, I'll respond on TikTok. Like I said, I don't have any videos yet, but I have a, I have a catalog and I'm doing some, some norming and storming around what those videos might look like. But uh, yeah, if, if anybody wants to reach out, I'm happy to have a conversation, you know, whether it be, hey, just, just want to say hi, or whether it be, I have a difficult time and I just need somebody to chat with. Go for it. Well, Blake, thank you so much for that. Keep doing what you're doing. We'll, uh, we'll get you some love on TikTok. And uh, thank sure. you for your time and, and your insight tonight. I greatly sure. appreciate it. Yeah. yeah, likewise, Joe. I appreciate the time. appreciate the invitation to, to be, uh, be part of the podcast, be part of the community. You keep doing what you're doing as well, man. You're, you're greatly motivating a lot of people. So, Thank you, man. It means the world. If you enjoyed this episode of the Project Indoor Podcast, go ahead and subscribe, leave a review on your platform of choice, and share this episode with a friend. It helps us get more conversations like this out to more people like you. We appreciate you, and we'll talk to you next time. And one more thing, if you're looking for a community of people all striving to be better together, check out the Project Indoor Hard Things Club. The link is in the description below. We'd love to have you.